beautiful day to you and thank you for joining me on another episode of the Women's Series where we capture developments and stories that impact women. I am Ayomide Ogute and today we're shifting focus a little bit to talk about one of the thriving sectors women are doing excellently well and that of course is the interior design industry. Now what you find out these days is that interior designing seems to be a sought after profession in the corporate world. Now despite the growth trajectory, the primary challenge interior designers face today is figuring out how to uh, maintain their finances while developing and implementing a profitable business plan. Uh, today, I'm speaking with a veteran in the interior design space and talking about none other than um, Inka Oshobu. Inka Oshobu is the CEO of CMC Interiors. Hello, ma'am. How are you doing? It's good to have you today. Very well, thank you. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's quickly go straight into the conversation for today. But um, for a start, how is the industry doing at the moment? I mean, how, I mean, for a start, you do expect people to ask that, oh, how did you get into the business? But let's skip all of those and then ask, how is the industry as of today? Doing. Um, yes, thanks for skipping all the other questions because I've, I've spoken about those so many times and so many times. Yeah. So. It's nice to just get to the meat of what, what is going on today. Um, of course, um, we have unique challenges, obviously, in Nigeria, you know, in terms of the interior, interior um, space. I think that we all know that the current challenges has got to do with the economy and the devaluation of the Naira. And of course, unfortunately, we don't produce uh, a lot of what we use. I always um, explain that um, um, the interior design industry in Nigeria is similar to that of a car uh, manufacturing industry. We don't really produce any of the components. We have over 500 components. Um, for example, in my own factory, I'm mostly a manufacturer, right? And, um, and of course, do interior designs for a lot of my clients. But um, because we, so we're like a car manufacturing company. So we take consumables from everywhere mm -hmm. and everybody, and we put it together you know, to the table or to the chair or whatever it is we're making. So really, we are not producing enough components in the space. So we are very, very um, import dependent. And of course, we are facing challenging times now because of the valuation of our money and just the difficulty of um, doing business. However, we're trying very hard to stay afloat. And uh, there are always positive things about the situation because it really is forcing us to look inwards. And that's what we're doing right now. Right. I needed to get a clarity on what the growth trajectory is at the moment in Nigeria. Because, I mean, over uh, in the last uh, couple of years, let's say 2021, according to FIRE, there was a record that um, the industry as of today stems values at about $121 billion. And I wanted to understand what Nigeria, uh, how is Nigeria um, doing in that regard? But anyway, let's move on. The success of any firm, we definitely understand that is dependent on the service or the products and most importantly, the clientele base. Now, what is your approach to attracting customers and how have you been able to manage them coming back over the years? We understand that um, CNC attracts like the HNIs and the high profile and all of those things. But how have you been able to, I mean, if we take out Inka or Shobo out of CMC, I mean, there's, yeah. we can't take out, yeah, we can't take out, they are both important components in the, in the business and to make up the brand. How have you been yeah. able to maintain that trajectory? over the years? Unfortunately, one of the uh, problems that we do have is that Yinkao Shobo and CMC and for a lot of businesses are always inter, intertwined. Yep. It's not really how things should be ideally, but basically that's basically how, how it just happens. But yeah, um, I think over the years, what we have stood for was quality. Quality and service um, and value for money and um, added value to everything we do. And I think this is finally paid off. From the beginning of COVID to now, we found that about 70% of our businesses are repeat customers. So that's really, really a good statistics for us. We even have parents who are encouraging their young married children, you know, to buy from us because either our product has been with them for years or they've had a good experience with us. So that was really gratifying to find that, to, to find so that speaks to the fact that one really should stay with one's core business yes. and, um, you know, know what you're doing and, um, you know, stay with it, stick with it, find ways to continue to listen to the customers 
I always used to tell myself and my staff that the business has its own language and the business would always speak to you. And this is actually quite true for, for my experience over the years, both internally and externally with customers. So we do a lot of things to stay on top. Of course, we still attend exhibitions. Things are much, much easier now with social media. I mean, with the rising cost of a ticket and the valuation of dollars, I can get all the latest collection without even leaving you know, my office. The factories and the people that you have formed um, partnerships with over the years are sending you things online. Of course, it's never you lose something all the time by not being physically there. Yeah. You, you, don't, you lose uh, the feel and the texture of things. But generally, it's better than not having an opportunity to see things. So you stay, up, you stay on top of things. Again, the furniture business is like cars. It's like fashion. It's like building materials. Things, you know evolve and change and there are constantly new trends and new colors and new types of fabric for example now um microfiber is very popular um in terms of for, for upholstery so it changes and we try to stay on top of things the customers are on top of things so it really does help if you stay when you are not on top of the designs and the trends the customers know Right. I was going to ask about trends and designs and whatnot, and definitely that's leading me to my next question. And one key thing you mentioned is, uh, and of course it speaks to your secrets, and it is not far-fetched, that of course is quality. I mean, if you can be able to maintain the standard and the quality over the years, definitely the HNIs and these high-profile set of people, we think that you've been able to attract over the years, I mean, with track record and all of those things, will definitely come back. Now, how do you, as an interior designer, manage to stay on top of both the latest designs and your client's expectation with so much going on around? Like I said, our clients are highly educated about what they, what they want and what they need and what they like and what they deserve. With social media, they are on top of things. So they bring these things to us. Apart from what we do in terms of staying in touch with the trends through exhibitions and um, a lot of um, our suppliers who tell us what's new and what's in fashion, like I said, our customers are highly educated. And in fact, they come already knowing most of the time what they want. Mm -hmm. So mainly a, a, a thing of interpreting what they want and trying to um, um, give them, deliver in terms of what, what, what they like and what their specifications are. But yes, they are highly educated. They know what they want. They know, even if they don't know what they want, they know what they don't like. So that helps. That makes a lot, uh, our job a lot, a lot easier, you know. So um, I think it's great. It's, it's, it makes things a lot easier when people know what they like. They bring the designs, they refer us to uh, things they've seen on the internet or things they've seen on the movies. And um, it's just a fun, it's just a fun way. It used to be the other way around. It used to be us, you know, trying to impose things on the customers, trying to direct and, um, and um, lead into a certain design or certain, but now it's, it's more the other way around. It's more customers telling us what. Yeah, they it's, it's it's customer focused this time around. And um, one focus. Yes. One yes. key thing that I know that is very important for any organization is human resource management. It is very important. Yes. Now, we understand that your staff strength is approximately, if not more, correct me if I'm wrong, about a hundred employees. How have you been able to manage this over the years? Well, we have um, over the years. <laughs> It's like a family. We really, truly have a family business. Um, over the years, we have at least, I would say, 45 to 50 percent of our staff that have been with us, let's say, 18 or more years. We are now 27 years in the industry. Wow. So we have a good core base staff retention mm -hmm. in the core areas so that, that when uh, we have, and of course, you have certain areas or certain staff that really just go and come in the industry. We really feel that people go and come, but the core people have stayed over the years and they are able to now train or carry along the new people that have come. So it's hard to know what, we've, what, we've, what we're doing right in terms, but I think it's caring about our workers, having a family um, um, atmosphere, listening to them, having a lot of flexibility. You know, workers want flexibility now. And... Um, the unfortunate part of all of this is that less and less people are interested in the type of artistry that we do. Everybody wants a bank job. Everybody wants an office job. Everybody's getting a degree. So we're having less of a pool of really qualified, um, of really qualified young people that want to be in the industry and want to learn. So that's a challenge. But uh, over the years, I think um, 
just being a family-based uh, business that cares about the people that work with us is what I'll say that we've been able to do. Yes. I never knew that that's a new challenge. People trying to, people them moving from one industry to the other. I never thought that. I feel like everyone wants to be an entrepreneur at this point, as opposed to the corporate world, nine to five kind of thing. But it's good to understand that that's a challenge that um, 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 the industry is facing. And we hope that, I mean, one of those things, of course, you learn to navigate it very well. Now, yeah. there is no way I wouldn't end this conversation without asking what should those who are new to the industry avoid? I mean, coming from your wealth of experience over 27 years or 27 years, as you said, what should those who are new to the industry avoid? Hmm, that's a very tough question, actually. There's so many things. Oh my goodness. Well, obviously, you know, you really want to start with knowing what you're doing. You really want to start with um, um, a good understanding of your market because even though it's interiors, we tend to be lumped in together as basically one lump sum. You understand? And it's such a wide and open um, industry. I mean, you have people who just do purely interior designs. A lot of people come to me who want to do purely um, interior design and they basically feel that all they have to do is match colors all day. So you really need to understand which and where you want to play. So of course you have the architects that are involved, you have the builders, you have um, people who are really purely just designers. I mean, people who really sit and say, you know, this room should be yellow and it should have blue chairs. So who just sit and do that. And then you have people like me who are interior designers, but more so the executioners, the people who would execute what all these other people want to do. So I'm really more core and manufacturer of bespoke furniture. So I work with some interior designs, I work with architects, I work with builders. And of course, over the years, we've developed our own retail line as well. So I would say just know where exactly you want to play in. Right now, I'm aware of quite a few young people now who have come into the, in the industry. I, I, I don't know her name, but I know of a lady who all she does is recover old leather sofas. And that's her niche. And mm -hmm. so she's doing that very well and she's becoming very popular. You have a lot of high-end clients who have bought very expensive uh, leather sofas and they're cracking or they're, you know, they have a blister here and there. And she's able to restore and recover them, which is really, really nice. So you have a lot of new players, but I think what's nice about what they're doing is knowing exactly where and which area they want to play in. And I think they're coming in more um, competent and more educated in those specific fields. However, I think the challenge for them would continue to be um, the hands, you know, who are they hiring and where um, the resource uh, of HR would be for executing all those jobs. So it'd be interesting, for example, if we all got together and had a big school you know, and in those days, there they were a lot of training schools for carpenters and for artisans and for sprayers. A lot of them are, are not existing right now, or they're very small and they're not enough to serve the market. Um, so that would be the first thing I would say, know, know where you want to play, get your finances, you know, in order, um, know, know what your tax liabilities are, um, position yourself, you know, in terms of geographically, where you want to be, you want to be close to the clients that you 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 want to serve, and that's that's a whole lot. And we're always willing. Um, another great resource is the Faith Foundation. I've worked with the Faith Foundation. I've been a member of the Faith Foundation for many years, so they are a good resource beginning for new entrepreneurs who want to get into the into not only the interior space. A lot, you know, uh, they are an NGO and they work with entrepreneurs, encourage them, and then put them in touch with people like me. You know so that they can be uh, mentored and um, um, guided as to what they want as to what they want to do. I mean, these are real facts and real nuggets from you. And that's a good way to end today's conversation. Thank you so much for taking our time to sure. do this with me. It was, I'm super grateful. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now, in conclusion, you would understand that interior designing is challenging, no doubt. But as an interior designer, you can be assured you are not alone in making mistakes. Now, when it comes to interior designing, the best part is that make these mistakes and these mistakes can be fixed. One of the simplest ways of avoiding mistakes is learning from the ones committed by others. Now connect with other interior designers. Do not forget to do that so that you can not only have meaningful conversations, but also seek mentorship, which of course it is very important. Share ideas, 
search for jobs, and even hire talent. And on that note, we end today's conversation on the Women's Series. I hope you've learned the hard nuggets and so pick out one or two things about the industry and um, thrive and thrive very well in the industry. Until next time, if you've got questions or you'd like to reach out to me, kindly send a mail to women's series at proshare.co. Do not forget to also follow us on our social media platforms shown on the screen. Also log on to our website and subscribe as well at proshare.co. Until next time, I am Ayo Mediokuntoe. Thank you for watching. Thank you.